think about this before you bring home the statue of any deity. Ask yourself, would you want that person as your roommate? <laughs> so Ganesha is pretty easy going. He likes the sweets. He's pretty chill. He gets along with everybody. Easy roommate, right? 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 Namaste. You're listening to the Savana Podcast. Join us on an exploration of Eastern spirituality, yoga philosophy, and conscious living for the new age. This podcast is a production of SivanaSpirit.com, where you can find a large selection of Om and yoga clothing, spiritual jewelry, and unique fair trade gifts from the Far East. Now here's your host, Ashton Subbo. I'm Ashton Subbo. I'm here with yogi, poet, author, teacher, and artist extraordinaire, Charles Ekabumi Ellick. He's illustrated Sally Kempton's book, Shakti Awakening, Harish Wallace's book, Tantra Illuminated, and recently came out with his own book of art, um, which I actually have here, Shak the Shakti Coloring Book, uh, Goddesses, Mandalas, and the Power of Sacred Geometry. He's here with us today to talk about decoding sacred art, how to better understand the deeper meanings behind these ancient symbols as well as modern symbols. Ekabumi, welcome. How are you? I'm doing great. It's a pleasure to be here, man. Awesome. Well, I'm excited as well. Um, really happy that you've decided to come in and join us on the podcast. You know, just diving straight in. I mean, one of the things that I, I love so much about India is that everywhere you go in India, not only is there like a rich history and story behind the place and someone that's been like doing some type of practice for hundreds or thousands of years, but the, the entire culture is immersed and saturated in imagery. Uh, and all of these images have deeper meaning to them. Now, in our culture, we get saturated with images as well. Like we're, we're constantly bombarded just the same with images. But instead of having a, a deeper meaning to them, it's like someone's trying to get us to buy something. Or, right. you know, we might have some symbols that kind of point to like, well, this is a status symbol. I've, I've got a Gucci bag and that means I'm rich, you know, but it's not really alluding to something uh, deeper than that. Right. But with the with the growth of pop or the the popularity and the the growth of popularity of yoga in the West, right, a lot of people are starting to get exposed to a lot of these images from the East, and yep. I, I think as people see and get exposed more to them, they, there's a natural curiosity to learn more about them. So I, I know that that you not only create this this the sacred art and a lot of the symbols that we're talking about. Uh, I know you're also immersed in various practices and teachings that a lot of these images are conveying. And, and I understand too that you you used to teach children's yoga and uh, you started uh, creating some some of these images originally uh, as part of a, a teaching tool for your for your children. Now is that actually kind of what inspired you to go deeper into sacred art or did you already kind of have um, a passion for it and then it was just its natural platform and, and grew from there or, or what really got you into sacred art? The short answer is yes. The, the kids class really sort of kicked my ass into gear. Um, I had been having the urge to be making sacred art but I hadn't really given myself permission to do it. It's so, especially Hindu iconography, it's so complicated and everything's sacred and people are sensitive about it. But it's like with the kids class, I'm doing it for the kids. And I could draw cartoons and it could be playful and it was fun and I could really focus on very simple principles that the kids uh, needed to learn. And then the coloring helped them to settle down and focus and memorize things. And then their parents could do it with them. So that's what really got me into gear to, to making sacred art per se. But of course, I had a degree in art from college, number one. Number two, I've been feeling a strong urge to make sacred art ever since I'd been assigned a deity practice by the guru that I had at the time. And he assigned me, he actually, uh, he wanted me to keep a picture of the deity I was assigned. He said, in your wallet, like the picture of your sweetheart. So you see it every day. And the problem was that none of the calendar art and the sort of the mainstream pictures I saw of this goddess matched what I was experiencing when I was doing the practice. I was having these visionary experiences and I don't think that's unusual. It sounds really extraordinary, but when people go into these practices, and even I believe if people go into visionary spiritual practices of any tradition in the world, 
they're going to start having visionary experiences if they're doing meditative practices. And we need a vocabulary to understand that. And I don't feel that a lot of the modern depictions of the Hindu deities match uh, what's actually happening inside uh, the, the, the Chudakasha, the, the, the cave of, of experience, you know, the, 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 the uh, screen behind our eyelids when we're actually doing the practice. Um, and so un being unable to find an image that matched what I was experiencing, I kept getting this little tickle in the back of my head. It's like, well, you could do this. Hmm. You could draw this. I was like, no, no, not worthy. No, no, I don't understand this stuff. No, no, I'm really not sure. And um, I did do the pictures for the kids' coloring class. And then finally I broke down and did an image of this goddess in the way that matched how I experienced her. The very first drawing I did, I posted it on Facebook, of course. <laughs> and it's like, oh, I just did this drawing today. And um, the scholar Harish Wallace that was the first image he saw. He was blown away because this is an image of a goddess that he works with. And he was so flabbergasted and it was so, it matched so much his experience of her that he hired me to illustrate his book. And that just launched my career, like out of the box, just boom. boom. Awesome. <laughs> There's no like spending years practicing at home alone. That was the first real deity image that I did. And it was, it, it, it really just popped out of me like a, a birth because, um, there wasn't a lot of practicing. I just sat down one day and put in eight hours and out came the image. Now, do you, uh, obviously being a committed yogi, do you, and you, you've already kind of mentioned that you, you had a guru at the time that was pointing to a particular image. Um, what is currently, like what does your, your practice look like? I mean, do you have a daily practice? What does it tend to? We were, we were talking um, the other day, and you were mentioning there's there's a heavy meditative component to your practice right now. Like, what are you working a lot with this imagery still, or is it more meditative practice? Do you still do things like asana? Like, what what does your practice look like these days? Well, I think that my primary practice is taking care of my health, and my secondary practice is keeping my wife happy because that's the goddess I live with. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and then if we're going to actually talk techniques that people might recognize as yoga, um, I do put in anywhere from two to five hours of seated meditation currently. Um, I'm working with a very wrathful and very ancient tantric goddess by the name of Kalashin Karshani, um, uh, most closely related to the goddess people now know as Kali. And um, I still do asana practice, but because I'm a householder and I work and I'm teaching uh, and I have things to cook and dishes to wash is very difficult when you're putting in two to five hours of seated meditation every day to find the time for asana and I'm really, really missing it. And I've got to say, now that I'm doing so much meditative practice, because I was an asana teacher, as you know, for over seven years, I really get why asana practice is so helpful for seated meditation, why it is so helpful for the, uh, if you might call higher um, energetic practices and visualization practices, it really helps to harmonize your system and settle the mind. It makes everything easier. And so when I don't get to do my asana practice each day, I'm only practicing like twice a week right now. And I really, really miss it. And I've got to say for anyone listening out there, if you're a meditator, do some asana. It will only make your meditation better. And if you're an asana person, I highly recommend the meditation because it's going to happen sooner or later anyway. People. It's, just it's inevitable. <laughs> it's inevitable. Yeah. So you might as well practice now and make it a regular part of your asana practice. You know, do it at the end of your, your asana thing. You do your shavasana and sit. And just whether you're doing a pranayama like Nadi Shodana or you're chanting the names of, of God, and that could be any deity, not just a Hindu deity, but just take 10 or 15 minutes. That's the asana practice gives you that clear mind, settled body space. It's such a beautiful state to meditate in after doing your asana practice. I just see people, you know, you and I have both taught. You see people, you finish the class, they don't even do the shavasana. They just yeah, stand right up, go grab their shit, grab their, their phone, turn it on, start checking their email, and they leave. And it's like that sweet spot. It's like they've missed the whole, they've missed the, uh, it's, it's a shame. Yeah. So. Well, 
Indeed. Um, so let, let's say that I'm 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 the beginning beginning yogi, and perhaps even the, the person that's that's so busy that they gotta they gotta hop out of class before the shavasana, or or maybe let's say where I'm the person that I'm coming in a little bit more, and I'm starting to see these images, whether it's you know in my yoga studio, or I see them at a, a local alternative bookstore or online, um, and I'm starting to get you know attracted to the images, like oh that 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 looks like something that's interesting. You know, what's your advice? Like, where does someone like that go? What do they do? How do they start to find out more about this stuff? I mean, do they just go and, and Google something? Or even if they don't even know what that image is, like, what, what's, like what's, what's a good way to, to kind of deepen the interest or sort of kind of get their foot in the door of, of learning more about this stuff? Well, first off, I want to encourage people and I want to validate people's curiosity. I don't want to discourage people, but i got to say what my teachers told me, which is believe nothing on the internet, and that, that uh, Wikipedia is like a, a giant horror zone of mixed messages and unreliable data. That said, I've learned a lot online, and I still look online, if nothing else, just to see what the sort of the popular conception of things are. But the problem is when you just do very superficial research on the internet, mostly what you're getting is what has been written by uh, very religious people, by people who are devotees, and so their deity, whatever their deity is, is the numero uno, and everybody else is just an emanation of their deity's one truth. And so everything tends to be very biased. Um, the other issue is that this very religious and moral interpretation of the deities isn't necessarily compatible with our yogic practice. Because again, we were saying, you and I agreed that uh, it's kind of inevitable that some kind of meditative experience is going to come up if you do asana practice long enough. Uh, the, at least there'll be uh, windows of opportunity. It's going, to, it's going to come into your field of awareness because it's part of the energetic practice. It's part of what it's designed to do. So I also believe that our experiences of deities, whether or not they look like they have an elephant trunk or not, but that's also going to start to come up as our spiritual practice deepens. Now, whether we recognize them as Hindu deities or not, or whether we just recognize them as enlightened virtues, we're going to start having experiences, and as a result of these experiences, the great icons of divinity from all world traditions are going to start making more sense to us. We're going to get attracted to them, because we're going to be grappling with our internal experiences. We shift and grow as a spiritual being, and we're going to need a vocabulary to describe this experience. And whether those are Christian icons or ancient Greek icons or Egyptian icons or Hindu icons, I think that that's also an inevitable part of the practice. If you do it long enough, that your energy body is going to start and your mind is going to want to understand what's happening to your energy body. And your energy body is going to go and start seeking the company of people of similar temperament, mm -hmm. right? This word that the uh, Buddhists call uh, Sangha which is so beautiful. It's like your spiritual family. Mm -hmm. You're going to, you're going to, if you're, if you're a biker and a gangbanger, you're going to want to find your, your bros and you're going to hang out with them. And if you're a yogi, sooner or later, you're going to start feeling a certain kind of uh, camaraderie and you want to start hanging out with the people who have sim similar values and a similar temperament. And that includes the iconography because the friends that we start cultivating, again, whether we call them deities or we call them archetypes, or we call them enlightened virtue, power, consciousness, energy, whatever you want to call them, they start becoming a part of our circle of friends too. Where do they go to find out more information? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I want to answer your question more directly. <laughs> it's really hard, dude. It's really hard because there are not many sources that go for this deeper interpretation of the icons. Um, there's a lot of books out there. Some of them are okay. Some of them are better than okay. Uh, I've been doing a series of courses with uh, livingsanskrit.com and then the Mata Mayura Institute. That's a complicated name, <laughs> but uh, Mata Mayura, it comes up. Spell it like it sounds. Um, there's a couple of books I brought with me. Although it's a Buddhist book, I really think that this is probably the best book out there for and we'll, um, say, we'll say the name for those that, that aren't joining us with the video. So it's the Encyclopedia of Tibetan Symbols and Motifs by Robert the, Beer. The, the reason why this book is so valuable is that he goes into what the iconography means and how it relates to the spiritual practice, which is so rare 
in books that speak about the iconography. There's a big book version and then there's a smaller paperback version and for the average person doing asana, the smaller paperback version is fine. It's easy to find and easy to buy and that's why I recommend starting. You just have to translate the names from the Buddhist uh, pantheon into the Hindu pantheon. But really, as some of the scholars I've talked to agree, um, tantric Hindu practice basically went up the mountain in the ninth century and was preserved in Nepal and Tibet. The iconography, even if the names are different, the deities are different, some of the practices are slightly different from Tibetan Buddhism, but the iconography is virtually identical. The same symbols mean almost exactly the same thing. The same clothing, the same animal skins, the same postures, the same mudras. It's very, very similar. And so that's a great place to start. It's a good, reliable book. Awesome. So let's let's dive into some perhaps some more specific examples. Um, you know, walking in again to let's say like an alternative bookstore, or yoga studio. I think a, a very common image that we see not only in India, it's very common, but uh, but common here in the West is that of Ganesha. It's uh, the the elephant headed child. And um, but l- l- let's say I, I know nothing about this. I just walk in. I see this this image, a picture, a statue of this kind of chubby kid with an elephant head and. You know, he's got uh, some different arms in one hand. He's got a certain way, and he's got an axe in one hand. He's holding some sweets. Um, he's got a lotus, and there's like a there's a mouse hanging out by his feet. Like what 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 all is this kind of pointing to? I mean, is it um, is it just kind of like hey, there just happened to be a mouse there, and so they're doing that, or there's a mouse and that? Like what? How do we start to really understand the deeper meaning of these symbols? And I know there's you know obviously there's multiple layers of, but but where can we where can we start to just dip our feet in to get a sense of, of, of what these symbols might mean? Okay, well, first off, Ganesha is one of the most popular deities throughout all of Asia. He's been adopted in many, many different traditions and even what we would call religions. And it's because the principle that this elephant-headed figure represents is so key to get on our side as spiritual practitioners. He's the Lord of Things. Uh, Gana means thing. He's Ganapati, the Lord of Things. He's kind of like a cosmic telephone operator. He helps to make the connection from this thing to its meaning, or from this thing to how it applies in my life. And that's why he's invoked before rituals and teachings in almost every spiritual lineage um, related to Buddhism or to Hindu, uh, whether it's Tantra or Orthodox, Vaishnavism or Shaivism. All of these different traditions, they all invoke Ganesha as the Lord of Things. And that's why he's at the front door of yoga studios and Indian restaurants. He's also the guardian of thresholds because it's knowing where am I right now? That's kind of a thing. And where am I going to? That's another thing. And so he helps us to figure out uh, where we are and where we're going. So setting all that aside, the images that we see of Hindu deities, whether we're talking about Ganesha or Shiva or Hanuman or Shiva or any of them, right? They're like a visual book. They're like a pictogram. And not just a pictogram that represents one thing, because Ganesha does a lot of stuff. But more like a book that you can actually look at the clothes that he's wearing, the ornaments that he's wearing, the objects that he's holding in his hands, his little buddy, the mouse, which is called the vahana or the vehicle, right? The, the kinds of ornaments that he has, like his crown. All these things are laden with symbolism that give you clues to what you might experience if you start working with this divine principle that we've given a name and we've personified and called Ganesha. So a few things. One is because Ganesha is so popular, there's many different kinds of depictions. Now you said this chubby kid. You gotta remember that we can approach Ganesha and in the Hindu tradition, even in the Christian religion, we can approach Jesus as the child, right? And there's many hymns and prayers to Jesus as the child. So the child form of Ganesha is Bala Ganesha. Bala meaning child, just like Balasana, child's posture, right? So most of the Hindu deities have child forms. Then you can approach Ganesha as a friend or as a father figure, like as, as, a, as a spouse. I mean, I know it sounds a little strange, but Ganesha is actually a pretty erotic deity. And if you look in his iconography, that trunk, he gets up to all <laughs> kinds of hijinks with it, man. It's, it's pretty something. So you got to remember that there's lots of different forms of the deity. So even looking at his age is a big clue immediately to how you're interacting with that divine principle of knowing how things fit together. Invoking that principle of intuitive understanding 
of how things relate to each other because that's what he represents. Now, he often carries a hatchet. That's really the power of discernment separating real from unreal. Many deities carry sharp instruments, some of them covered with blood, right? Almost always this sharp instrument uh, can be broken down to separating real from unreal. There's different meanings, like a flaying knife that skins off the fake persona has a slightly different meaning from the sword of righteousness, right, that, that cleaves right from wrong. But the, the, remember, his power is the power of things and knowing how things fit together and where they fit. So I really interpret his hatchet as discernment, knowing real from unreal, and knowing what is appropriate and inappropriate. You also see him holding a lotus sometimes. A lotus is a quintessential Hindu symbol. It is, uh, appears in the hands of many different deities. It really represents purity. It represents uh, the ability to stay pure in the world, which is considered kind of impure and dirty. It's this uh, quality of immaculate birth because it represents the cosmic womb, and it's associated with the mother goddess. Uh, another thing that you see him carrying a lot are sweets. These are particularly important for Ganesha. Sometimes other deities, you'll see them holding a cup full of blood. The, uh, sometimes that cup is a skull cup, and that represents our skull. So that's really, in the Buddhist tradition especially, they emphasize the skull cup. This represents the empty mind, that when you've cleared your mind of thoughts and preconceptions, the brain, all of your ideas of what you think is right or wrong, then it's empty and it can be filled with the nectar of realization, the nectar of, of enlightenment. And that's what the blood symbolizes, because red, Shakti, it's like power. It's the goddess herself. And so that's the nectar of realization. So when you've cleared your mind and you really understand your relationship with the universe, it becomes filled with this nectar of realization. In Ganesha's case, it's filled with sweets, because Ganesha loves the sweetness of life. He's got his big belly, he's easy going, very different from his brother Skanda. So the reason why the sweets are so important for Ganesha, and that's the sweetness of his realization, obviously, same symbolism right here, but it's not filled with blood, it's not power, it's sweetness. So when his trunk turns towards the sweets, we're invoking this knowledge of things and how they fit together so that we may experience the sweetness of life. But when his trunk is turned to the right, away from the bowl of sweets, that means that he's more interested in getting things done. He's more interested in practice or he's more interested in his hatchet, which is almost always held in his right hand. He's more interested in kicking ass, if you will, rather than laying around and eating sweets. This is why, as a beginner, you should always pick a statue of Ganesha that has his trunk turning to the left towards the sweetness because an elephant, a hungry elephant, is you don't want to get in the way of a hungry elephant. That's all I got to say when I've talked to people in India, right? Hungry elephant cannot be stopped. But an elephant that's got food in its mouth, it's easy going. It's peaceful. It's, it's okay, right? So that's a big clue about the disposition of this principle that you're invoking into your yogic practice. So that covers just a couple of the basic symbols. Oh, yeah, and you mentioned the, the, the thing where he's holding up his hand like, Fingers up, palm forward. It seems to be kind of a universal human symbol for I've got no, nothing hidden. There's nothing in my hand. I'm not here to hurt you. Hello, greetings. In Hindu iconography, that palm forward, fingers up symbol is abhaya, the mudra of no fear. So the deeper understanding of this that I hope that your listeners get is not just that Ganesha has these powers. It's not just that you want to get these powers by worshiping him or invoking that principle, but rather that the symbols deities are holding in their hands represent the characteristic virtues that we are cultivating by invoking that principle into our life. So when we are invoking that principle of knowing where things belong and the right relationship between things, when we're invoking discernment, when we're invoking purity, then we're going to taste the sweetness of life and we will have no fear. They all fit together. And if we really truly understand the sweetness of life, the nectar of realization, and we have no fear, remember the two attributes in his front hands, the bowl of sweets and the palm facing forward, we're going to have discernment, we're going to have purity because they all fit together. It's all part of the same package. Awesome. And then furthermore, and you'll like this, man, you'll notice that the arms radiate from the heart chakra. 
So anything that's on the arms or held in the hands is understood to be an emanation of the heart chakra, which is the wisdom mind. So when you see the attributes held by the deities, this really represents the fruition of your wisdom mind expressing its power into the world, just like the symbol of the deity. Awesome. I love it. Um, you know, let's, let's change gears for a moment and, and switch to another really common symbol that, that you see all over yoga studios. Um, and that is right. of this, you know, this chaotic figure dancing in flames and Nataraj. Um, right. Now, as we both know, this is an extremely rich symbol. Um, I mean, literally lifetimes can be spent teaching on the, the significance and, and layers to it. But if, right. if, if, I'm, if I'm this beginning yoga student again and I, and I walk into a yoga studio and I see this giant nataraj and I'm, I'm drawn to it, like what, what, is, it, what is it pointing towards and, and, and mm-hmm. why, why should I care as, as someone who's like, okay, well, I, I grew up in the West. You know, I don't, I don't have um, – this isn't you know, part of my religion or, or anything like that. Right. But I see this symbol and it's, it's interesting enough. But why, what, what might draw me into it further? Well, first off – even though we're in the West, and this is a quote-unquote Hindu symbol, you get people like Oppenheimer quoting the Bhagavad Gita. You get the, the statue of this Nataraj, the one that you're describing right here. They've got a huge version of it in front of the large Haldron Collider in Europe as a symbol of the dance of the universe, the dance of energy. Shiva, if we could really oversimplify things, Shiva is consciousness. And so he's engaging in the dance, of, and it's not your personal thinking brain kind of consciousness, but the underlying intelligent, I don't want to say intelligent like brain. Again, it's really hard to translate these Sanskrit things into English, but it's the um, intelligent patterning of the universe's inherently conscious nature Oof. that is being represented. Say, say that five times fast and we'll... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't even remember what I just said. So, but this is why physicists love this symbol, because there's, there seems to be this very intelligent patterning to the universe, this cohesive quality to it that seems almost playful, and, it, and it's exuberant. And this is what's being represented by Shiva in his tan, Tandava dance, right? Now, you're not going to see the symbol of Shiva in a studio of people who are devotees of Krishna or of Vishnu. We have to understand Ganesha appears almost every, everywhere. It's like, I want to understand how things fit together. But the people who worship Vishnu kind of have a different understanding of the nature of the universe and the underlining organizing principles. So the first thing you know when you walk into a studio that has a big statue of Shiva is that these people are at least nominally aligned with Shiva and the iconography of that particular yogic tradition. Before you think that you, um, that thing's really cool, man, I love it. I want one of those to take it home with me because that's a bitch and man. Um, these symbols uh, are, are potent images that help to repattern our, our unconscious mind, if you will, our deep seated knowing. And when you start practicing yoga, we're coming into alignment with these principles. They're coming alive in our field of awareness. And when we bring one of these potent symbols home, it's kind of like a seed crystal. It starts anchoring those principles into our life. So one of my teachers said, think about this before you bring home the statue of any deity. Ask yourself, would you want that person as your roommate? So Ganesha is pretty easygoing. He likes the sweets. He's pretty chill. He gets along with everybody. Easy roommate, right? That's why they assign Ganesha to little kids. Now, Shivanatharaj, he's in the process of destroying the universe, man. He's crushing the ignorant, uh, the dwarf of ignorance, right? He's got. He's holding a flame. He's uh, hiding things and revealing things, and he's banging his drum about the the rhythm of the universe. There's a big circle of flames around him. And he's gorgeous. I mean, he's sexy. There's no doubt about it, right? But do you really want that as your roommate? And in the tradition, it actually says no, that this symbol is to be worshipped in temples, but at home it might actually disturb the harmony and the peacefulness that you want to cultivate in a home environment, unless it's somebody like you, Ashton, who's a yogi and this is your life, 
then you might bring Nataraj home. I don't know. I might take Nataraj out of the living room now and put him back in my altar room because maybe that's making a little too much chaos in the living room. This is, this is good advice. Well, they say, I mean, if that's where your main altar is in the living room, that's fine. <laughs> the, the one thing I was told and that uh, I was trained in is that you just don't want him in your bedroom unless you're a serious full-time sadhaka because in your bedroom you want to be able to sleep. And the symbol is so active. In fact, any deity who's dancing... You don't want to have a dancing deity in your bedroom because in your bedroom you want to rest. So this is one big symbol that people can take away from this talk that we're having. Any deity that's dancing means that you're invoking that principle in its most active, vigorous, and joyful form. So Shiva, there's many symbols of Shiva, uh, statues of Shiva, where he's sitting still. Yogeshwara, where he's sitting under a tree and he's teaching people and he's got his legs up in lotus. The legs bound means that the energy that's coming down to the earth which is where we live, that's where the feet touch, right? The energy that's coming down to the earth has been pulled up, so he's kind of bound in a knot, and so his energy is very cohesive and stable. So any deity you see sitting in lotus posture, the principle that we're invoking, we're invoking it in its most stable and peaceful form. But any deity, like I've got a statue of Ganesha here on my altar where he's dancing, so Ganesha can dance too, right, the chubby kid. Shiva loves to dance. You're invoking that principle of consciousness in its most vigorous and joyful form. If you're invoking Ganesha where he's dancing, you're invoking Ganesha in his most vigorous and joyful form. You've got to be careful about these things, my, you know, because deities are big. And if you've ever run around an elephant, maybe it's, it's a little bit, uh, you've got to be on your toes. If the elephant's dancing, you don't want to get crushed. So the idea is that most beginners should not bring home a dancing deity. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's the first cool. thing to understand. You're invoking consciousness in its vigorous, most vigorous, joyful form. I, I think it was in, uh, I think it's in your book actually, and it's, uh, I don't know if it's in your forward, but it's from Sally Kempton talking about a, uh, a yantra that you had made for her. And she was kind of thinking like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll get this yantra in. And then she gets it and this is like vibrating, powerful, like supercharged yantra. And she's like, man, it, it, like, it completely changed where I had to put it. And like, it was a whole different vibe just because of how, how intense the, the energy surrounding the yantra what, what actually is or was. And for people out there that are like, what does he mean by energy and all these mythological beings, what does this have to do with me? Again, I want to say that if you're doing a spiritual practice of any tradition, you're now expanding your consciousness. You're coming into alignment with these cosmic principles. So Sally Kempton had to rearrange her whole house around this particular symbol. I went and visited her. It was really great. She built a whole new altar underneath it. But she's been doing practice for like 40 years, you know? Somebody who's just walking into the local head shop and they just see a picture of Nataraj or a picture of the Sri Yantra, maybe they're not going to have that experience right away. So I just want to validate people. Like, you, you can't expect this to just, it, I mean, it could, but it's not necessarily going to explode in your face the first time you see it. Well, we could liken it to, uh, like, you know, if I drink a thing of wine, I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, it's wine. You know, some people drink and they're like, oh, like, oh, yeah, there's there's a hint of uh, bacon in there and some right. strawberries. <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're much more attuned to the subtleties of, of what Absolutely. that flavor has to offer. That's a great example. And I'd even add to it, if you've been doing a uh, yoga retreat for a week, eating nothing but vegetarian food, getting up at dawn every week, and then you get out of the yoga retreat and then you go and knock back a bottle of wine, it's going to hit you differently than if you've been having a glass of wine every night for the last month. Like you, you, You're going to feel it much more intensely. And so I'd say the same thing. If you go off and do a, a week-long 10-day Vipassana retreat, and you come back from that, and your whole system has been ripped open and purified, cleansed out by this Buddhist practice, right? These symbols and these practices are very likely to have a more profound impact on your energy body, on your system. You're going to feel it. So when you see this in a studio, keep in mind that dancing, we're invoking consciousness, and that's why it's a great symbol for a yoga studio. We're invoking consciousness in its most joyful and vigorous form. He's got all these symbols in his hands. Again, I could spend a week talking about everything, but keep in mind that this dance that he's doing is he, he's destroying the universe in a very conscious and elegant manner. And the reason why this is important to yogis and why he's called the Lord of Yoga is that he's not destroying the physical universe that we're living in necessarily. I mean, maybe not right now. What he's destroying is this story of the universe that we have 
remember, he's consciousness. He's destroying this fake universe that we create of stories and prejudices, right? He's destroying our attachment to things. He's the Lord of Yoga because he's completely non-attached, because he's destroying this uh, mental construct of universe, and he's just experiencing it as it is. Does that make sense? And this is why he's the Lord of Yoga, because most yogic practices, not all of them, the goddess tradition, the goddess situation is different. But in most yogic traditions, we're trying to go from a state of duality to a state of unity. That state of duality is the manifest universe. There's Ashton in San Diego. Here's Ekabumi in Berkeley. Here's this computer. But in the non-dual state, we're understanding that this is all part of the same uh, the same flux of energy. We're all part of the same expression of consciousness. When you understand that non-dual state, the manifest universe ceases to be other. And in this symbolic sense, it has been destroyed as a um, objective, separate material reality. It's no longer any different from our body. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Cool. Um, is there, in terms of, I mean, because you are so immersed in, in this world and in this realm, is there a, a particular image, um, you know, if we could say such a thing, that, that, that's your favorite? Um, or, I mean, whether it's your sort of chosen deity or something that you love teaching about, like something that just kind of sparks your own inner fire of like, oh, every time I, I see this or get to talk about this, uh, that it really, it, it just, it sparks that inner passion inside because it, it's, it's talking to something really powerful. Do you, do you have anything like that? Well, I'm a Shakta. I love the goddess and I love yantras. Uh, so we haven't really talked about yantras yet or mandalas. Um, and me being an artist, and I'd been away from art for a while. Remember, I was getting this big push to start making images of deities. And I'm like, I'll start warming up on these geometric symbols. They'll be easy. The yantras are very powerful in that they are universal symbols, the geometric forms that represent patterns of consciousness. So that statue we see of Shiva is a symbol of consciousness, but it looks like a human. But we got to understand that Shiva is not necessarily human. He's the consciousness of the universe itself. So when we make him look like a person and we give him, we personify him and, and make him act like a person or think like a person, we're actually just narrowing down our ability to understand the vastness of this cosmic principle that we're calling Shiva. So a yantra being a geometric form is much closer to this pattern of consciousness, this, this intelligent arrangement of energy that we could call a deity. So these yantras, I adore them because I went into this thinking, oh, it's just a triangle with some color in it. That'll be easy. I started having very profound experiences with them. And so I love these symbols. And the most basic yantra is a triangle. So the upward pointing triangle, again, the symbol is that the base of the triangle, that represents uh, diversity and duality, the, the universe, lots and lots of things. So that's why it's wide base. And then the tip of the triangle represents unity. So this is why Shiva is typically associated with the upward pointing triangle. This is also why you hear Shiva being associated with the linga, right? The linga means symbol or sign, right? It's also interpreted as being the male phallus, right? Shiva and Shakti, uh, the, the uh, lingam and the yoni, right? And if you look at an upward pointing triangle, it can be interpreted as somewhat phallic. This rep represents the solar path or the masculine path of yoga, right? We talked about the dissolution of the personal ego and destroying uh, all sense of duality and separation. The converse version of that, and my favorite symbol, is the downward pointing triangle. The base of that triangle is very narrow. It's a point. And then it moves out to a broad top. That represents the goddess practice, goddess sadhana, which is where you're starting off as this little nugget. You think you're special. You're an individual, right? You think you're an island, right? No man is an island, that whole cliche, right? But you think that you're an individual, and then you do the goddess sadhana, and you expand your awareness. Doesn't that sound tantric? Sounds like yogic practice. You're expanding your awareness until you understand yourself to be the entire universe, including duality and all of manifestation. 
So the downward pointing triangle represents manifestation and the yogic process of merging. It's a watery practice. Whereas the upward pointing triangle represents the yogic practice of burning, of disillusion. So the two together make a six-pointed star, which you see over and over. I mean, the, the Jewish tradition uses it. They picked it up actually from, well, it's a world symbol. But they started using that in the 13th century, whereas the six-pointed star, the Satkona, has been used in the Hindu tradition for thousands of years. Literally, we can trace it back with the archaeology. I'm not just throwing numbers out there. It's like the swastika, ancient Hindu symbol. It at first appears about 3,000 years ago. This is archaeological hard data, right? And of course, in the oral tradition, we understand from the teachings that many of these symbols are even much, much older if you're willing to accept the oral tradition. So I love yantras, and I love that elegant symbol of the goddess herself, the downward pointing triangle, representing her powers of knowledge, will, and action coming together as one. Beautiful. Well, um, if we if we wanted to, to connect with you and, and find out more about this stuff, obviously this is your passion, this is your love, this is your life. Um, how can how can we find out more about you? I mean, obviously we can we can create some links uh, that will be connected with the podcast, but uh, maybe you can talk to that. Um, some of your courses, website, your book. How can we find your book? Which is something that actually I've already gotten as a gift for other people. Like I've had awesome. friends come over, we've colored pages together and stuff. Like I, <laughs> I love your book. Um, but yeah, where where can we find out more about you? Well, first off, you can uh, read about me and and a lot of the basic principles of sacred art in the Shakti coloring book. It's it's a stealth teaching book because it looks like it's just for fun and it looks like it's really cute and there's all these sexy goddesses in it but it really is an introduction to sacred art as a spiritual practice as a meditative practice and that's really no different from what we do on the mat because really the human body is said to be the ultimate yantra and a yantra yantrana it's the it's an enlightenment machine it's a realization device so the human body itself is a living yantra and so as we work with sacred art, we start to understand our own life as art. And so people can find out more about my views and beliefs and even my bio. It's just right in the Shakti Coloring Book. You can get that online. It's on major websites, Barnes & Noble, Amazon.com. It's published by Sounds True. They can get it from that site. If they want to order a signed copy from me, that would be really nice. Where can and they we can find get that? that. <laughs> yeah. OneEarthSacredArts.com. Uh, in the store. If they follow the link to the store, it's right there. So uh, my name, Ekabumi, means One Earth. So the website, all one word, no space, is oneearthsacredarts.com. Does that include uh, in, uh, information on how to get in touch with you about your workshops? I know that you were just recently or, or still are doing a, a deity workshop. Um, where can we find out more about that type of stuff as well? I'm going to encourage people to go to livingsanskrit.com. LivingSanskrit.com is a beautiful site. We're still in the process of building it, although we already have some classes and newsletters and things going there. We're going to be launching very soon. That's the place where I am going to be building a step-by-step -step course on sacred art as a spiritual practice. It'll be um, separated into separate, um, uh, I guess you'd call it, uh, disciplines or categories so that people will just be able to take or view the classes on iconography if they're not interested in making art. Or they can just uh, look at the ritual aspect of it. And the Living Sanskrit site is going to include not only lessons on Sanskrit, but also on puja. Like, you get these symbols, you take them home, all of a sudden you're like, ah, oh, it would be really great, you know, I've got some incense, you're burning it at home, you're, you know, you're yoga hippie, you've got a candle. And all of a sudden you're putting all your things you got in India, somebody gives you a little statue of Saraswati they brought back, right? You start putting all these things together in one spot, and before you know it, you've got an altar. What do you do with it? What does it mean? Where should it go? What should I put on there? What's not appropriate to put on there? All this stuff, we're going to have it all put together on the Living Sanskrit dot site in a very, very organized and cohesive way so that people can actually understand the symbols and what to do with them. Awesome. That's exciting. I'll look. Uh, I'll definitely be looking out for those too. I think I actually just saw that you've got a, uh, and an, was it an altar course that has started on living Sanskrit already, or it's like a. Tell me about what's going on right now that I've seen. Well, um, one of the teachers on living Sanskrit is a fifteenth generation Vedic priest. So his family's been doing this. They're, they're actually holders of one of the Vedas, and uh, the school that he teaches in is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. 
So he's handling all the ritual stuff. I'm just going to bow out of that. Like he's, <laughs> he's the expert, you know what I mean? So he's doing this whole class. Um, we've actually filmed it all. It's uh, in the editing process. It should be up literally within the next week or two. And that's a whole class on basic, simple home puja. And he's done rituals that take weeks at a time. Don't get me wrong. It can get as complicated as you want to go. But the whole site is designed for the home practitioner, and he's a total sweetheart. So he's doing a very simple class that people can do at home on uh, invoking these divine principles into our personal experience. And we use an altar, we use these symbols, and we use a little ritual practice. It's just basically a meditation, but you've got water and a candle and some incense. And so you're using these, um, what the Buddhists call material support. You're using these props to help make your experience of this divine principle or to make your principle, um, your meditation, more precise and intense, more visceral. So just like we can have all the experiences that you get on a yoga mat in a yoga class, you can do all of that stuff in seated meditation, but it's more intense when you do it in an asana class. You're using your body as this wonderful tool for your realization practice. So there's other things you can use too, like an altar. Awesome. Well, that's exciting, man. I'll, we'll definitely look forward for those when that stuff comes out and seeing what you continue to grow in that collaboration there. Um, website as well hopefully uh maybe there'll be a, a, another book out there I'll, I'll keep bugging you about making a hanuman book at some point just for that just so i can <laughs> i can grab all that um but i Egabumi, i i really appreciate your time your knowledge sharing with us um i hope we can actually get you back on the show again to talk more about this sort of stuff in the future and dive into i know you've to. got a, a vast well of of knowledge and understanding uh, oh, but, but so much. thank you so much for joining us today and um Look forward to seeing you again. It's really been a pleasure, Ashton. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having the show. And I'm really, I'm just so happy that the people who are doing postural yoga are interested in going past just the feel-good health benefits, which are awesome. First step on the path of the Dharma is health cultivation. But I really feel like you are at the forefront of what is happening in modern postural yoga, which is all the millions of people are doing the practice, they're starting to experience there's something more to it, and they're wanting to dig in, and they're wanting to learn more, and I feel like you're serving that need, and that this show is going to be so important for those folks. So thank you for doing what you're doing, too. Awesome, man. It's a pleasure. Well, namaste. We will uh, see you soon. Thanks, Akabumi. Bye-bye. Hey everyone, if you enjoyed this episode, let us know by writing a review on iTunes. It's the only way that we know if we should keep producing more episodes like these. It also helps us attract new listeners to join us every week and spread the word of yoga, spirituality, and conscious living. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you'll join us again next week. You've been listening to the Savannah Podcast. To find out more about Savannah, go to savannahspirit.com or follow Savannah on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Savannah Spirit. For daily inspiration, check out our blog at savannaheast.com. Be sure to join us next week for a new episode. And thank you for listening to the Savannah Podcast.